Do, the house? Yeah. Do under that house that no, so you know, we were on Cedar Street. Oh, Cedar Street, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we. Such a vast, unsearchable greatness. Great is Yahweh, worthy of all our praise. Let your people sound through the ages, all your awesome works till the end of days. We have seen your splendor. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Christ the King. Glad you guys are here. Hey, do me a favor and stand with me. We're going to engage here in the beginning with our call to worship from Psalm 14. We all know what it's like to experience busy weeks and seasons. Um, even if you were like I was on vacation last week, life still seems really, really busy. And so um, in an effort to begin our time by centering ourselves on God and His Word... Um, we look to the Psalms, specifically Psalm 14 this morning. And so let's just hear the word of the Lord and let's allow it to encourage our hearts and to direct our minds towards a consideration of him today. From Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Let's pray together. 
Father, as those spiritually poor and needy, we celebrate your love and the condescension of Jesus who saves and secures for us cause for joy. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 If you would uh, join us in singing, we're going to begin our worship uh, by singing Be Thou My Vision. by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to see. from Psalm 145, uh, one that we sing here pretty regularly on Sunday mornings. Um, and this, psalm, this portion that I'm going to read from Psalm 145, verses 10 through 18, just um, it reinforces the hope that we have as sinners, that if we um, confess our sin, if we call on the Lord, that he is faithful in salvation. Um, psalm 145, verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. 
The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Amen. We're going to sing, um, Oh, Praise the Name.
I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. we're so thankful for who you are and um, the ways that you have worked through Christ and in our hearts. I pray as we turn to your word that by the power of your spirit, um, that you would just renew our minds and our hearts to um, just love you and to serve you more. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, you guys can have a seat. And uh, as you do, let me invite you to open up to Luke chapter 16. Um, if you are new to navigating God's word, hey man, no shame. There's a uh, table of contents there in the beginning. There you can, uh, you can turn and it will direct you the right direction as you find in your Bibles. Luke, big number 16 is where we're going to be today, beginning in little number 18. That is verse 18. As you're turning there, I want to uh, make just a few announcements, and then, uh, and then we're going to read in its entirety God's Word, and then we're going to go back and we're going to, we're going to focus on a few points of conversation from the morning. Um, first, hey, I have received absolutely nothing but great feedback on our time with Jacob and Susanna Stewart two weeks ago. Um, and uh, so in that, I want to say this, that, uh, that we are um, in process of, uh, of developing a, a clearer timeline, but our desire is to move forward and to see Jacob come on staff here at Christ the King. Um, that being said, woohoo, amen. Uh, I want to give you guys like a week to voice any concerns or challenges. Um, and then after that, your opinion doesn't matter anymore. No, I'm just kidding, okay? Um, but seriously, if there are any issues that, that you have or questions that you have, um, we're going to take, you know, kind of the first half of this week to, um, to, to hear those and to uh, address those if needed. Um, and then uh, the plan is to... Uh, to kind of like announce some things midweek or next Sunday morning that kind of clarify timeline a little bit for us. Um, the second thing that I want to do is uh, I want to personally thank all of our uh, kids camp workers um, that came and served uh, the two weeks ago as a part of kids camp. We took up... Um, we took up an offering for Bible translation, and I uh, wanted to kind of like update you guys on that. And then here's what I want you to do, okay, because this is really cool. I want you guys to, um, to like, to make some noise, okay? And here's why, because our kids have been dismissed already, but these guys were a part of giving um, to, uh, to, to, to participate in the work of Bible translation, and we want to let them know that we appreciate them. They're not in here with us anymore, so making a little noise will assist in that. Um, in one night, we took up, we had two nights of, of kids camp. In one night, we took up $121 for Bible translation, these kids and the workers. So, hey, give it up for, for these guys. And for the In addition, uh, we took out of our uh, out of our coffee cleanup uh, forty dollars and twenty five cents. Appreciate that quarter um, for Bible translation uh, this this past month as well. So, um, if uh, if you have on your seat a slip of paper or a seat next to you, you can uh, visit the link on there, um, and it will walk you through like how you can participate in giving to support the work of Bible translation, which we are all about, man, because we love God's word and we want everyone to have access to it. Uh, so I think that that covers, I think that, covers that. Um, let's look at Luke 16. I'm going to read for us beginning in verse 18 and we're going to read through the end of the chapter. Um, great text this morning. Excited to be here and to be in it with you guys. Luke 16 beginning in verse 18. If you're with me say amen. 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 Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband also commits adultery. 
There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame." But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. To which Abraham responds, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is God's word. Thanks be to him for it. Let's pray together. Father, we pray and ask that you would, in our time together, open up our hearts and our eyes to understand the truths of your word, that apart from the work of your spirit, the gracious work of your spirit, we move forward without hope. Help us not only to understand your word and what it has to say about who you are, but that we might to apply it to our lives in the ways that you desire. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Two points of focus over 13 verses in what amounts to a continuation of part one of Luke 16 from two weeks ago. If you remember, Jesus was discussing the importance of faithfulness for the follower of Jesus with what is entrusted to us by God who is pictured in verses 1 through 16 as a good master. The challenge presented is to steward well temporal possession, monetary possession in particular, in preparation for the eternal gifts of the kingdom, of which Jeremy Wofford spoke on last week. In part two, which we're going to explore today, Jesus encourages a new approach to the stewardship of relationship, addressing an all-too-common problem revolving around those listening to his teaching, and life, okay? And so for the sake of clarity, verses 18 through 31 provide a challenge related to, first, the stewardship of relationship, and then the stewardship of one's life or time. And this is communicated here in Luke 6, 16 by way of a parable, We find through a broad flyover introduction to this portion of teaching from Jesus, not an effort to satisfy our curiosity around the complex issues of life and death, but instead to emphasize the seriousness of life and the choices we make on this side of the grave. So let's begin with a consideration of Jesus' teaching around the stewardship of relationship. The stewardship of relationships. Jesus comes out hot, setting his attention on the covenant union established in Genesis chapter 
to by God that can only be described as the most unique and intimate of human relationships. A relationship that Ephesians chapter 5 displays for us the covenant-keeping love of Christ for his church. This mystery most commonly referred to as marriage. Look with me at verse 18. Jesus, teaching his disciples, says this, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband likewise commits adultery. Now, I want us to be clear around the state of culture. There exists in our contemporary context a temptation to view the 21st century as one marked by the erosion of this union between one man and one woman. Now, just to be clear, I speak not only for myself, but as the pastor of this local body, you, when I affirm God's design and desire for what we can refer to as traditional marriage. I understand that the possibility exists that someone in this room struggles with either A, same-sex attraction personally, or B, knows a friend or family member who feels this struggle. If you would say, no, that's not me, I identify with the C option, that is to say that I don't know anyone that fits into either one of these categories, then I would just present to you that this is a false category and that this struggle simply hasn't surfaced around you yet. If this is you, know that God's word speaks clearly on these issues and issues like it and that I would love to sit down and to explore his thoughts from his word with you. While there have been, over recent years, advances against marriage as it is defined by God in the Bible, Jesus makes clear here that this departure is in no way relegated to the past 20 or 30 years as he speaks to a religious class engaged in another departure from the marital order, believing that you could get a divorce for almost any reason. What I'm seeking to do here is to encourage us because the temptation exists to look around and go, man, things are as bad now as they have ever been. And the reality that we are being called around here in this first portion of this morning's text is that there has been issue revolving around obedience to God's word and his design and desires for our lives going all the way back to the fall in the garden. You can read for yourself ancient texts that record the teaching of certain rabbis that would excuse legal separation for the most minor of offenses. Legal separation of spouses, one from another, for the most minute of offenses. We're not talking here about about safety or uh, an instance of abandonment, but simple dissatisfaction. Most oftentimes from a husband towards his wife. Now let's be clear on the instruction of God provided in his word. Husbands are charged by God with caring for their wives and pursuing after her good. And yet we find here an indictment. An indictment presented as they are too often, that is men too often, laying out and moving on because their brides can't cook or bear children. And so what is Jesus doing here in the beginning? He is aggressively intruding. He is speaking clearly on that which God speaks clearly on. Side note. There are a series of lessons that we can acknowledge here. Provide me just a a bit of latitude. First, as Bible believers, 
We are to speak clearfully and tactfully on things that the Bible is clear on. Jesus models that for us here. Jesus doesn't speak arbitrarily on issues that are not evident in the law and prophets, nor is he pushing progression. But instead, he is what? He's bringing clarity to intent and a call for needed reform and submission to the truth of God's word. There's a lesson that you and I can make note of here as it pertains to our engagement with one another and with the world around us. That is the first thing that we can make note of here. That is to say this, where the Bible speaks clearly, let you and I as Bible believers speak clearly and boldly. Let us speak clearly and boldly and tactfully around issues that Jesus has a lot to say about. Second, men, husbands, and those who aspire towards biblical manhood know that the marriage relationship is one that is to be stewarded. That it is one that is to be cared for, not neglected or abandoned. In the same way that you invest in a 401k or the, or the hottest cryptocurrency. Men, invest in your wife. Get this, right? Don't, don't ditch her, okay? But instead, date her. Man, that's tweetable if ever there has been one. If I'm honest, I struggle myself with thoughtfulness. Now, I know some of you guys. I know some of you guys, man, you are, you are absolutely killing it. You are crushing it with creativity around anniversaries or Wednesdays. Like, whatever you guys have got going on where you're just so romantic and connected and thoughtful, I see it. I'm jealous, I'm envious of, of your ability to move out and, and in this way. It's something that I truly aspire for. Because for me, stewarding my relationship with Courtney is something that I have to spend a ton of thought and time on. If this is you, the encouragement from Jesus within this text is not to bounce but to invest, to invest in your spouse. Ladies, hey, guess what? You are not off the hook here. Sure, men seem to occupy the majority as addressed by Jesus here. Nevertheless, your relationship with your husband is indeed a gift. As one commentator notes, Jesus addresses this culture reminding us that we steward not only our possessions, which we looked at in depth in Luke 16 part 1, but as it pertains to marriage, we steward one another. We live in a fallen world where marriages fall apart for all kinds of reasons, sometimes good reasons, in spite of every good effort from one spouse. Still, God intends that our marriages be lifelong as we steward it to the end. Why? Well, because this relationship, unlike any other earthly relationship, displays Christ's relationship with those who are born again. It displays Christ's relationship to the church most clearly. And therefore, the encouragement is for husbands to care for your wife till the end. Why? Because Christ cares for his bride, the church, till the end. We notice first within this text a call to steward well relationships. And as we transition down the page, we enter into what amounts to a majority of this morning's text and an encouragement to steward well one's life. Look with me at verse 19. Jesus enters into parable. And he says this, he says, There was a, a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted 
sumptuously every day. Are you guys with me? Say amen. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, who was himself covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. In verses 19 through 21, we find a a recount, a retelling of two very different experiences in life. Some present this story as parable, while others have come from the angle that these are actually two historic figures. Where you land on, on the actual historicity of these verses and their characters does not in any way change for us the central meaning. We find here a rich man who is, interestingly enough, intentionally enough, nameless throughout, and the poor man named Lazarus. As we are introduced to them, we find one who is draped in expensive purple clothing, enjoying daily the finest food, eaten off the most expensive placements. Lavishness is his lifestyle, and he quite literally wears his wealth on his sleeves. This is his recorded condition in life, and one that will undergo a dramatic shift over the course of this story. Now, the other character that we are introduced to is covered in sores, verse 20. Jesus shares this story and we imagine that those listening in are are hanging on to his every word. Lazarus is in process of starving to death. He sits by the rich man's gate daily, hoping for, for crumbs. Crumbs that find their way under the rich man's table. In the last part of verse 21, Jesus includes a detail that as I just read through and considered this week's text, intrigued me. Namely, the inclusion of certain canine companionship. We find the rich man, though knowing of the poor man, as will become clear as the story progresses, offering him no relief. Not even the simplest act of compassion. In spite of what? In spite of his lifestyle and abundant wealth as is being emphasized. Jesus, as he tells this story contrasts his unwillingness. His unwillingness to to aid Lazarus with the dogs wandering the street who present their tongues for relief as they lick his sores. There's emphasis around the thoughtlessness of the rich man recorded here. There are differences in life experience that will be replaced as we find in verse 22 with differences in death. Look there with me. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades being in torment he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Lazarus's condition undergoes a shift. Whereas in life he occupied space outside the gate, in death he finds a home in the bosom of God's friend and Israel's patriarch, Abraham. This would bring to mind for Jesus' listener participation in a heavenly banquet. 
A heavenly banquet more grand and lavish than the most elegant and extravagant of earthly parties. A party whose participation is purchased through faith in the promises of God. Supremely in the person and work of Jesus. Who what? Who dies to save. In a similar way, the rich man too experiences shift. Polar opposite from what he was accustomed to in life. Now whether you interpret this place of torment as hell or Gehenna, it would become clear that this is a place that he doesn't want to be. How do we know that? Look with me at verse 24. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Why? Because I am in absolute anguish in this flame. Now I made reference earlier. It was brief. It was a brief point of reference earlier to the rich man's knowledge of Lazarus. That is to say that his condition, the condition of Lazarus, wasn't one that escaped the rich man's awareness. This is where that comes from. As, as to Abraham, he makes personal reference to the one who now sits in his lap. What do we notice in verse 24? Well, we find indication that the same self-absorption that followed the rich man in life remains tethered in death as he requests care and consideration by way of water. Care and consideration that he withheld in his previous life. An experience referenced through Abraham's response. Verse 25, child remember that you in your lifetime you received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and, and you, a great chasm has been fixed. It has been established in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Again, one Bible scholar notes, the sin of the rich man was that he could look on the world's suffering and need and feel no answering sword of grief and pity pierce his heart. Well, what in the world does that mean? It means this. It means that he looked at fellow man hungry and in pain and he did nothing about it. The rich man's love of money, a stumbling block warned of in multiple places throughout the teaching of Jesus. Though most recently in verse 13 where he warns his disciples that they cannot serve both God and money has blossomed into a callous, self-justifying negligence of others' needs. And it finds its echo and mercy not received. I think we can collectively agree that the acts of the rich man are familiar to you and I. As Westerners, we are largely out of touch with this type of physical struggle, the type of physical struggle that is referenced in this story. And I say that in no way to, to undermine Difficult seasons that you have experienced or are experiencing, but rather to say that I imagine, which I confess can be dangerous, that they looked or look quite different than the recorded days of Lazarus. Physically, we identify more closely with the rich man of Luke 16. We are... If we are honest with ourselves, even in our most strained moments, quite comfortable. And those of Lazarus' state 
are often of some distance from us. What are we to take note of here from this story? There is an encouraged care for the poor that is woven through its fabric. The obvious lack of compassion from the rich man reeks and it convicts. From the follower of Jesus, there is, just to be clear, observable care for those who lack in this life that is to be evident. To the hungry, to the hurting, and vulnerable. This past week, I, I sat right here against the wall behind me because I'm always searching for an outlet to charge a device on. If you know me, say amen. Amen. I sat here and I was charging one of my devices. If it wasn't this past week, it was the previous week. I was sitting next to an outlet in Panama City, Florida this past week. Even there they have electricity, surprisingly enough. And an elderly woman in our community walked in with an electric bill that she was unable to pay. And she was asking for our help. This led me to immediately reach out to certain individuals within our church and discuss care ministry to our community and how we can do a better job and how we can do it more consistently. There's a mark of the Christian. Generosity and and charity. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. As Jesus' people, we lean into the struggle in our community. We lean into the struggle in our community and world, and we respond with the love of Jesus. We do so through the love of Jesus, which empowers us. This is what separates the church. This is what separates the follower of Jesus from every venture capitalist who donates to the impoverished who trend on Twitter. Our service as followers of Jesus flows out of and through the heart of God. Physical needs that we as the church and this church and her members must lean into. That assist in bringing light to spiritual need and the hope of the gospel. Needs exposed and met in verses 27 through 31. Let's look there together. If you're still with me, say, I'm still with you. Here we go. Verse 27. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. So we've addressed this issue of like why we can't, why we can't send Lazarus with, with water to ease your To ease your suffering. We've addressed this issue, but now let's turn our attention towards someone else. Send Lazarus to my father's house, verse 27. Why? Well, because I have five brothers. And I want him to warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, here's the deal. They have Moses and they have the prophets. They have God's word, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, well then they, this then will be sufficient to secure for them repentance. To which Abraham responds, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, then they are not going to be convinced, even if someone should rise from the dead. The rich man's second request, unlike the first, focuses outward. The first request focuses inward. It reminds us much of what we imagine his everyday life would have looked like. The second request is focused outward. Go to my brothers and warn them. Warn them what? Well, warn them this. Warn them that that there is more to life than this life. That there is more to life than the temporal. There is more to life than the momentary. That which is fleeting and compared in God's word with a vapor or a, a mist. 
There's more than wealth and, and comfort. Go and warn them so that they do not join me here. To which Abraham responds, They have God's word, and with it they have everything required for faith. And if they won't hear them, then you can rest assured that they will not listen, even if one would rise from the dead. The emphasis is this, right? The problem isn't the message. The problem is the audience. As perhaps you are uh, aware, my family and I spent last week away on vacation. Vacation makes regular weekly rhythms quite challenging when you know that Sunday is kind of like always coming, right? And so last night I took a, a little bit of time. I went out for coffee and, uh, and I went to spend some time in my notes in preparation for this morning. It was after dark when I left and as I was moving toward my car from behind me, I hear this. And I wish I could do the accent like the same way. Just imagine like a thick, like hard, like Jersey accent. That's what I heard. I don't know if that's the way this, this woman actually sounded, but that's what I heard. She said this. She said, she said hey, guy. That was close, right? So like that was, I'm not going to do it again because I feel like I won't do it the same way. But, but that's what I heard. Not knowing if I was said guy. I turned around and on the bench there was a, uh, there was a guy and a, and a girl who were dressed like cooks at one of the restaurants on the square who were obviously on a break. And as she leaned over, elbows on her knees with, with a cigarette in one hand and, and motioning with the other in a follow-up to, to, hey guy, she said this, she said, your backpack is unzipped. And as I flipped it around, I found the bottom portion of my pack where all of like my charging cables and electronic devices go undone. Things are just like hanging out. Like I don't know how I didn't notice this. It's like I had a, a tail, the tail of Steve Jobs following behind me there as I walked off the square. And so I kind of stuffed them all back in my pack making sure everything was, was there before expressing my, my genuine and heartfelt gratitude and continuing on to my car. And as I walked, I thought, man, I'm really glad that she said something. Because, like, those cords are not cheap, right? Electronics are not, are not cheap. And had one fallen out or become damaged by like falling rain off the trees, then that would have been like a great inconvenience for me. And then I thought back on Luke 16. Two quick points of consideration as we close that ran through my mind last night. And the first is this the choices that we make in this life, they matter. And what we find is that in death, you will either find the comfort of Christ or the type of, of torment and anguish referenced here that comes along with eternal separation and a consequence for sin. Now the gospel says this. The gospel says that out of the kindness of his heart, God the Father sent his Son. To live the life we have rejected and to die the death that we ought to desperately seek to avoid. The gospel says that unlike the rich man of Luke 16, Jesus took note of the broken and hurting people of the world. And at great personal sacrifice, chiefly his, his life, laid to the side his riches and made himself of no reputation for us. And that through anguish, 
and spilt blood and silence and abandonment and resurrection that he brings us from the gates into his kingdom and consequently his family. He provides for us a place around the table. And so as I'm meditating on on my brief, very brief conversation with this woman on the square. I began to consider the call to the skeptic. To steward life well. To steward life well. My encouragement to you. And our encouragement as Jesus people to those currently outside of the faith, whom Jesus is in process of drawing to himself, is the encouraged turning from sin. As you express trust in our resurrected King. That is the application for the skeptic. That is the application for the non-believer. To believe in and on this Jesus who is faithful as Walt has already shared with us this morning. To hear us and to save us. The prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah 55, 1, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and do you who have no money come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Call out to God. In faith, and know that he is kind and good to hear you, to forgive you, to breathe life into you, and to leverage your remaining days for his cause. That's number one. Number two, for the follower of Jesus. Can I talk to you guys for just a moment? For the follower of Jesus, the expectation is that we would steward our lives well as messengers of this great news of hope for dying people. If out of consideration a stranger can bring to my attention her concern over my earthly possessions... Should you and I, born again followers of Jesus, not leverage our influence? Should we not leverage our voice for the cause of Christ and the eternal good of those around us? Dude, the older I get, the older I get, the less concerned I become about A, things that do not really matter, And B, what others think about me. And I say that not as a license to act like a punk. But to say that I am less concerned with being cool. And I'm less concerned with being relevant. And I'm most concerned with faithfulness to mission. Am I stewarding my voice for the kingdom? For the glory of Christ and for the good of my community. In this life and in the one to come or am I not? The choices that we make on this side of the grave, they matter. And so I want you to ask yourself this. And we're going to rest in these points of consideration as we move into a time of response. In just a moment we are going to spend... A a concentrated moment in prayer and meditation. We're going to consider God's word. We're going to pray. We're going to engage in, in gospel conversations with one another if that feels appropriate to you. Ask yourself this. Am I, as a steward of life, Sensitive to the physical and spiritual need that exists around me. Do I have a a heart willing to, to help? A heart willing to help others even if it's risky. 
even if I deem them undeserving. And even if it costs me something, because we have been made to recognize our own need for God. When I see the physically or spiritually hopeless, the helpless or or hurting, do I understand that this is my position before the Father? The good news is that in our condition, in our condition, God helps And because he has helped us, we are freed. I want you to hear this. Because God has helped us, because he has saved us, because he has forgiven us and redeemed us through faith in the finished work of Jesus, because he has met our every need, you and I as Jesus' people, are freed and fueled to steward our lives for His glory and the help of other people. Let us consider these points as we close celebrating the charity of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, grace that saves, a truth that we can bank everything on due to the realities of the resurrection because our King, Jesus, is alive. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your love for us. We are grateful that that you see us rebellious and separated. That you see us suffering even when it feels from our perspective as though we are not suffering. You see us and you save us. You save us as you soften our hearts. as you bring to light this this revelation of your character and your nature, the way that you work in your word, you move in us and in over us, your spirit enlightening our hearts and, and opening our minds to understand truth. Help us in these final moments. To find rest in the good news of the gospel that says salvation is possible. Help us in these final moments to, as your people, give ourselves to a, a contemplation of living out gospel mission and your desire for our lives. May we be stewards. May we be stewards not only of the things that we possess, good gifts from you, but of our relationships, of our influence, and of our remaining days, all to your glory, for our good and for the good of those around us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We're going to take just a, a few moments and in our seats, we're going to continue to, we're going to continue to respond. We're going to give to support the work of gospel ministry here in our community. We're going to give to the work of Bible translation. You can find again those sheets on your seat that will aid in the campaign that we have, that we have begun. $1,456 we've taken up for Bible translation. Our goal is $5,000. You want to be a part of that. God's word reveals his character and his nature to us. It confronts us with the realities of our separation and calls us into hope in Jesus. We want to see other people have access to this life-giving word. 
So let us respond by, by giving sacrificially as those who understand that we follow a God who has given himself for us. Get on your knees and pray. Ask God to stir your hearts, to give you a desire to engage our community and the lost in it with the hope of the gospel, that we might be a people who are awake, who are awake and passionate for the mission of Christ. Let's spend just a few moments responding to God's word, and then we are going to lift our voices in celebration to our King.
hey, one quick thing before I turn it over to Walt. Um, Rain, if you would put up our Connect uh, slide card, that'd be super helpful, man. Hey, if you have, uh, if you've kind of been here over the past couple of weeks, if you're a visitor, if this is your first time, man, I would invite you and encourage you to fill out one of our digital Connect cards. We just want to be able to say like hello um, and to let you know that we love you, that we appreciate you, um, and to talk about ways that maybe um, God is is working in your life to facilitate and, and create community with him and with others that are members of this local church. So we're going to leave this up for, for just a second. Grab a picture of it. Um, I'm going to give you like 15 seconds because we got other things to say, okay? But this is important. So maybe we'll throw it up afterwards. Um, that way you can, you can check it out when we're done. But hey, man, I love you guys. I appreciate you. I'm so encouraged by, um, by your, your commitment to the Lord and for your love for Christ and this local church. And uh, man, it's such a joy to do ministry with each of you. Well, yeah. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for being here with us this morning. Um, just a quick reminder: we do have MC's Mission Communities meeting tonight. Uh, if you don't know what that is, or if you're curious about it, Rebecca is going to be hanging out at the coffee station um, after church. So just uh, catch up with Rebecca. She'll uh, she'll point you in the right direction to get plugged into an MC's. And um, again, thanks for being here. I'm going to read a uh, a closing blessing for us, and then we'll sing um, doxology together. May our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came with grace and truth, also fill your heart with grace and truth as you serve him in the days ahead. And may the joy of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be your strength. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. church. Jesus loves you. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week. You guys are dismissed. Praise the Lord who ransoms and rescues. Praise the God of glory who ever reigns. He is holy, judging the wicked. Guarding the Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless 
The Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ. our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ.
to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
So oh. 